carpool and more. Uh, so this is essentially uh, hot off the presses. Uh, we merged the spec last night, the night before, uh, but some work's already gone into this, um, and uh, we hope to have a, an implementation to share relatively soon, um, or, or a full implementation at least. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the pragmatic improvements uh, to syncing performance. So uh, really, the, the heart of the problem with, with syncing and trying to get deduplication uh, in any sort of batched way is that uh, in a distributed system, uh, you're always contending with local knowledge, right? Like 100% like of the time. Uh, the other thing, um, why do I have? There we go. Um, the other thing uh, is that uh, some of your peers are more pure than others, right? Uh, especially if you're a service provider, uh, you have, um, uh, you don't need to be as general, right? You don't have to say, well, this might be, you know, going from uh, an iPhone to an Android phone directly. It's like, no, this thing's sitting on EC2, it's got tons of RAM, it's doing its thing. Um, and I know that we're going to be pushing and pulling from there, and that I have a less capable, one side of this equation is less capable than the other, right? Often. Um, this is all work that's happened inside of uh, Fission. Um, Justin, uh, who is doing the actual implementation, uh, hoped to be here. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it. Um, but uh, also, uh, you know, uh, SE is the one who's actually doing the, the real coding work on this. Um, you can absolutely ask me questions about this uh, as well, but uh, if you want to know more about the, the Go implementation, uh, he's the one to ask. <clears throat> So uh, big caveat, this is, again, not general, right? This is, uh, so BitSwap is amazing. It's completely general. It works everywhere for all cases. Um, this is an optimization on top of that. That is for trusted, and we'll talk a little bit later about how we can get this to untrusted, point to point, and again later, how we can get out of point to point IPLV transfers. Uh, the problem is that in practice, um, doing transfers in BitSwap has been painful. We, uh, lo everyone in this room, I'm sure, uh, uh, loves IPLD, um, but uh, we have deeply nested cross-linked data that uh, can't all fit onto our clients, um, that really benefits from deduplication, and has multiple writers. If we could use a mature, universally supported transport, we could write things like light clients, where we don't need the entire IPFS node. So, you know, setting up JS IPFS in a browser or setting up uh, Kubo on a desktop and connecting and doing transfer that way um, has been uh, uh, challenging both, right? So, like, definitely in browsers, right? It's like really difficult. And in, um, if you just want to upload something, spinning up uh, Kubo, sending some, some data across and then shutting it back down again is like really not what it's intended for, right? It's like really meant to be a long living process. Uh, we are currently uh, at food, water, and shelter, right? So uh, getting bits from point A to point B is not reliable. So we need to have some way of making this better. Um, and uh, uh, earlier, uh, Hannah had mentioned, you know, uh, gaslighting herself for several years. I've gaslit myself for several years of like, and then BitSwap will work, and we won't have to worry about this at all, um, and somebody else will figure this out. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, the, the result of this talk is somebody comes up to me after and says, you know, you're just holding uh, IPFS wrong. Um, but, uh, and like, th that would be an amazing outcome. Uh, but uh, right now we're, we're really solving, I just want to get bits across the wire. Uh, so again, uh, browsers, uh, GitHub Actions as well. So if we want to um, have like a publishing flow, things like that, uh, and also CLI. <coughs> so th these are the main places that we're running this stuff today. Um, I also know, you know, uh, a bunch of other teams have tried uh, running this stuff uh, on uh, native mobile as well. And mobile is where people do uh, most of their computing these days. Like your, your average user do, do not walk around with one of these, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, keeping, even keeping the nodes reliably connected has been, been a challenge. So we uh, do a peer connection 
and then 45 seconds later, it drops. And it's even dropped in the middle of a transfer. So we're like halfway through transferring a photo and it just stops, right? And we have to stop, detect that, reconnect, start it again, like all of these things, right? Um, up and down over an HTTP gateway uh, is just LARPing decentralization, right? We, we've, we've created an Apache server with extra steps. That's my spicy take for this talk. <laughs> um, native push doesn't make sense today because it looks like this, right? We send a request to a REST server that goes to a managed uh, IPFS node that says, hey, do a, uh, a pure connection and then uh, we can actually do the transfer, right? So like this whole extra ceremony doesn't need to be in there. We just wanna say HTTP connection, send it over or web sockets or something. Right? This is a extremely simplified reductive version of BitSwap, but th this is the, the, some of the core parts of the, the, the challenges that we have with it, right? You say, top of the graph, do you have this thing? Yeah, totally, I got that thing. Great, and then we, we look at it, we find more links, then we make another request. Hey, do you have these other things? Oh yeah, I got those. We think about it again, we say again, hey, do you have these things? Well, I only have this one. Oh, okay, great, and you know, and, and, and on and on we go. <clears throat> and from a pure performance uh, point of view, the bottleneck in here is latency, right? Uh, going back and forth, while it's on the wire, you're not doing any, any useful work. So how can we compress these so we're doing fewer transfers, right? This is really the, the, the impetus behind this whole idea, right? So if you have really wide data, uh, BitSwap actually does a really good job because it can discover the links and say, hey, you know, here's the thousand uh, SIDs that I need, send these all in one, one request or you know, uh, add, add these to my want list. Um, and so that's great. If you have really nested data, uh, it doesn't do quite as well. And I don't know about you, but my data mainly looks like the, the red one, right? Um, and so trying to cut this down, like we, we can try things like compressing the graph, right? So uh, prior arc, there, there's a whole bunch. Uh, you just heard about one, uh, one version, right? So uh, desync, um, where essentially you open a, a car file or a streaming car file and you start appending blocks to it and those go across. And that immediately improves things like 1,000x, right? It's like way better. Um, graph sync, uh, I was kind of hoping that graph sync would solve all of our problems. Um, it doesn't quite do the deduplication part that we want, um, but we can reuse a lot of this, right? We're, we're working at an orthogonal point from uh, things like selectors. So you should still be able to use selectors and say, I want this part of the graph, and then use the rest of carpool, which we'll talk about in a second, to say, but not the stuff I already have, right? Uh, the fundamental problem is that you know the top of the thing that you want, and you know the parts that you have, but you don't know in between, right? Um, in the web native file system v1, uh, we had a hashed history table, and we could use this to sync as well, because it essentially turned into a stream. It was essentially a manifest that we could then analyze and say, okay, I'll, I'll send these across. Um, and then a lot of um, projects also use a, a, something called a Merkle bloom, where you have a Merkle tree that uh, its index inside of it is various sized bloom filters that talk about its membership. So this was kind of the, ins the original inspiration for where we end up going with it. Uh, there's actually tons of research in the space. Uh, how to do um, uh, uh, performance graph transfer is like actually a well-studied area. It's a, literally an impossible problem. Um, but you can do better by uh, creating trade-offs in the system. So doing a one-to-one point-to-point transfer. Overall strategy is to start by reducing the scope of things that you're looking at. So we're not gonna talk about all the blocks in your store. We're gonna try to somehow, using some heuristics, whittle that down. Send some, ma <coughs> excuse me, some manifest or index with your request, request and then uh, use heuristics to find uh, deduplication. And even if the deduplication is wrong, like even if it's slightly off, that's fine because we can always clean it up later. And our worst case scenario, if we have no deduplication, is it starts to look like BitSwap. So we're always doing somewhat better than BitSwap by using heuristics. Um, this has been our uh, uh, internal rallying cry for this, right? Is like uh, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Um, 
we can uh, stick them together and send them over the wire, but if you don't need to send something, that's even better, right, if you have them locally already. So you need to find some balance um, between these two, right? So we're trying to cut down latency, but we're also not, uh, you know, you can cut down latency immediately by saying, well, just send me your entire store, right, like uh, up front, and that's going to have other consequences, right? So we, we still want to keep this deduplication. <laughs> and the curve looks a little bit like this, right, where if you're extremely inaccurate, you get really good latency because you just start sending stuff, right? Um, and then on the far other end, you're really accurate. You don't send any duplicate blocks or very, very few, um, but you have this higher latency because you're always going back and forth. So we want to find roughly this section here and play in this area. Um, so the TLDR is we get enough of a performance improvement that we can afford to be a little bit messy, right? We're going to have some duplication, um, but we're going to do much better on, uh, on latency. And we're going to miss some blocks sometimes, and that'll trigger extra rounds, but that's also okay because we're going to be somewhere in this, this section. So step one, reduce scope. Um, if you're coming from a, a, well, actually, let me bring all these up. Um, if you have no overlap or you're going from a complete cold start, you just start by making guesses and you, over subsequent rounds, so this middle one, uh, you start to learn more about what the, your other peer has, right? Um, and you're gonna start sending back and forth uh, information. So you start to learn more as you go. Um, through multiple sessions, so the next time I connect, if I haven't cleared the cache from last time, I already know some stuff about you, or you can send in the request, hey, I'm, up, I'm pushing or pulling an update to this data structure, right? This thing in DNS link, or in ENS, or relative to this other SID. And we can diff that and do much, much, much better uh, in, in that case. So some back to the ma napkin math, uh, if we just do uh, a list of SIDs, um, depending on the, the version of SID, that's like, you know, let's call it 53 characters, roughly, uh, each uh, times half a million nodes, that's 26, 27 megs, um, and gzipped, that's about 12, 11, 12, um, which is too big to send across if we want to get, you know, five megs of data, right? Like, it's just en ends up being huge, especially in a, in a web context where you're sending way too much um, data uh, up front. So can we do better? Uh, Bloom filters uh, are a probabilistic data structure. Um, so sorry if this is review for, for some of you, um, but just a really qu quick primer. Uh, you have a, a sequence of bits. Uh, each of them is a bucket, and it just can be zero or one. Uh, you take an element, you hash it uh, k times, and you take the hash as an index number, and you set that to one. And you do that for all the elements in your, uh, in your sets. And some of them will overlap some of the time. Uh, so sometimes they won't. And uh, you'll never get false negatives. So if you test by uh, hashing an element and placing it inside uh, and, and it doesn't change, then, yep, this is, um, uh, this is in the set already. Um, it'll never tell you that something isn't there when it is. Um, but it might tell you that something is there when it isn't, right? So there, it, you're getting a much better size by giving up a little bit of accuracy. So uh, if we take this um, half a million nodes with a false positive rate of one in a million, so in, in general, we, we recommend uh, adding one order of magnitude to the false positive rate, like you can tune, tune the parameters on, on a Bloom filter, uh, that's about 1.7 megs, and uh, that's 93% savings over the, the ungzipped version. And gzipped, uh, that's 92%, so uh, uh, not quite as good in, in practice, but you know, pretty, pretty close. Um, and that's under a meg now. Um, so we've saved about an order of magnitude uh, over a, a plain manifest file. Um, and on average, because we have this order of magnitude um, uh, better in the false positive rate, Usually, you'll actually have zero false positives. Uh, on, on average, you'll get one every 10 requests or so. And uh, you can also adjust the size of those based on how many elements, you know, the size of set that you're working with, right? It's all, all, all tunable. So the stages uh, are selection. So, uh, you know, initially saying, this is the kind of thing that I want. Trying to do some narrowing on that. Uh, you may or may not be successful, uh, but you try to do some narrowing. Uh, the actual transmission. 
doing the analysis on the graph that you've gotten back, and then doing cleanup. So anything that, um, you know, at the end you might have some, uh, it's called stragglers in the, in the literature, um, last final elements, and then you have to say, like, here's just a manifest file, like, g give me the last few. Uh, and then you operate these in rounds. <laughs> so as you learn more about the graph, you can narrow down further and further and further um, uh, as you go. Uh, on the wire, uh, we send uh, these bloom filters uh, roots for the, uh, the subgraphs that you want. So as you're walking down this graph, obviously you'll start with one typically, and then you'll discover some more structure, and then you might have multiple. It's essentially a want list. Uh, and then we're going to construct a car file and send that across. Um, and pull and push. Uh, this is from the, re the requester's side, right? Um, obviously it would be mirrored for the, the, others, the other one. Um, looks a bit like this, where it's like, well, I know about this part of the path in green, and then the, everything below here is what exists but I don't know about yet. And vice versa, when you're pushing, it's like, well, I've already pushed this stuff, never send this again. Uh, and then below that is like, well, I know I need to push this one. And then this red dotted line is, uh, I got the um, bloom filter and it said to not send this one. But on the next round, they're gonna tell me explicitly, hey, I need this subgraph, this SID, directly. Right, so you're never gonna get stuck. Uh, this is most, like, 95% of, of uh, the, the high level for pull. Um, so uh, if you have previous context, uh, great. You can uh, pull that in, analyze which routes uh, you need, uh, and construct a new bloom filter, send that across, and then you'll get back a car file with a bunch of records in it. Uh, and now you have an updated bloom on the requester side and on the, uh, on the sender side as well, and vice versa. If you're pushing, uh, it's, it's not exactly the same thing but reverse, but it's pretty close. And this is in quite a bit more detail in the spec, as you can imagine. Uh, and then finally, straggler cleanup. Uh, so we've gone through, um, and you know, our bloom filter has excluded these orange nodes. We don't know about the red ones yet. On the next round, um, the other side is gonna say, hey, uh, I need these specific ones, these subgraphs, you didn't send them to me. Let's do the next round and let's clean these up. Uh, constructing these and actually walking over this graph every time can be expensive. Uh, so you can uh, perform graph contraction. We're actually finding uh, lots of use cases for, for this general technique uh, where you break up the graph somehow, uh, often at um, uh, where you have a, a fork or a merge uh, and create a bloom filter at each of these, whatever your boxes are, because bloom filters have this nice property where you can just add them together and get uh, the sum of the two. <clears throat> Carpool, uh, we actually haven't written the, the complete spec for this yet, um, but we want to recover having multiple providers so that we can get that nice um, you know, streaming in true parallel, uh, do work sharing, um, and this is a stepping stone on the way to having this be trustless. So today, all of this assumes the other side has some, some portion of the data, I trust them, they're gonna send me, send me stuff, and I know that we can have a reliable connection. Um, having complete, going to completely trust this, we'll talk a little bit uh, at the very, very end. Uh, there's two ways of doing this, right? One is uh, requester controlled, so somebody has their iPhone, um, and they can uh, use uh, rendezvous hashing to break up the request, request into buckets and say, hey, can you send this to me, these and these? And then uh, the providers can communicate uh, in background, and this is why it's trusted. Right? Um, and uh, so, you know, A to H doesn't have a certain block. They'll talk to the others and say, hey, if you have this, also send this as part of your car file. Um, invertible bloom filters. Um, are a great way for um, nodes to share entire um, sets with each other and to figure out what the difference is. So this is for providers sharing things with each other. <clears throat> um, so this is a regular bloom filter at the top here, uh, and the rest of this will not be to scale. Um, an invertible bloom filter uh, takes, um, so each bucket now has two, it has a counter, so in this case three, and some XOR of all the SIDs that are inside of it. Um, that means that there's three things in this XOR. Obviously, you can't recover all this stuff in there until this counter goes down to one, right? It has some nice properties. 
if you add them together, just like a regular Bloom filter, uh, and you XOR these, right, you get, um, actually, <laughs> I didn't uh, update the, the numbers at the bottom. Imagine those are updated. Um, uh, you'll, they'll just sum together, and then you can also go the other way. So you can XOR um, the second one into the last one and recover the first again. So it has these really nice algebraic properties. Um, once you get down to one, you can start, you have the regular, just the SID, and you can pull that out of the entire thing, and some of the other ones might flip to one, and you can start pulling out lots of data and lots of SIDs and reconstructing this manifest. Um, so this is the really high-level version um, of this. Uh, you should go to Philip's talk um, about this uh, later today, tomorrow, today, today. Uh, so then, uh, it, you know, you can have a similar picture where you go through a single coordinator, right? So you make a request to one of them. Uh, they're all sharing these invertible bloom filters, the providers, with each other, and then they can stream in, like, they can make smart decisions about who has what and uh, how they can efficiently break up the, the task. The other thing you can do when you have multiple, pro multiple providers um, is uh, use techniques like linear network coding. So uh, in this case, we have three providers. Uh, they have... Uh, set A and B, or streams A and B, and then the third one will take the XOR, like the um, bitwise XOR of A and B, and now if you get any two of these, so you get A and B, obviously you get back A and B, you have A and uh, A XOR B, you can pull that A out with XOR, because XOR is amazing, and recover B. So you only need, uh, if you're on an unreliable network connection or you just want to get you know, uh, from, from multiple sources and, you, you know, really performance conscious, this is a really nice way to, uh, to go up into it and, and do that. And finally, uh, some bonus wild ideas for the future, like private set intersection, private set union, neural network compression, uh, XOR folding, and more. Um, and I'll just really blow through these. Uh, so uh, private set intersection uh, and, and union um, lets you share a set, basically broadcast, hey, this is the stuff I have without actually sharing the elements, and the only one who would be able to uh, recover that is somebody who has some subset, and then you know what the subset is between the two. Um, this could potentially get us up into um, being able to have untrusted nodes. Uh, XOR folding, uh, something that we just started looking at very recently. Um, it's usually used for privacy-preserving uh, links, um, but you take a bloom filter, you break it in half, after that it degrades really fast, um, line them up, and then XOR them, and uh, you actually don't lose uh, much in the, uh, in the way of being able to recover things. You do get false negatives in this, in this world, um, but it actually performs pretty well uh, for the most part, so this is another uh, privacy mechanism, and it also has the, the added benefit of cutting the size of the bloom filter in half. Um, and then... Uh, just because I was talking about uh, all these privacy um, things and, you know, coordination between multiple providers, um, Boris and I are giving a talk tomorrow on uh, the Content Address Alliance, which is an idea we have for what if the backbone providers, so Fission, Cloudflare, Vertical Labs, et cetera, coordinated and uh, pre-shared, pre hey, we're storing however many terabytes of data, um, you don't need to go out to the DHT. You're mostly making your requests to these providers. Yes, you can still drop down into the DHT if you need to, um, but you should probably ask us first, or we can tell you uh, who, who has what, or even precede to each other, hey, this is popular content. Please store this for me. So a little bit like the Bytecode Alliance or the Bandwidth Alliance, uh, if you're familiar with those. And uh, yeah, that's the whirlwind tour. So let's say that you're on you're the you're the requester on a phone, right? You have a hundred thousand blocks. Right? You stick that all into um, uh, into the Bloom filter, and you say, "I want this everything under this content address, except for the stuff I already have." You send that to the server. It starts to construct a um, a car file, 
skipping anytime it sees uh, something that's in the Bloom folder. And so it can start to carve out, okay, I think that you have this bit only, and if the Bloom filter has a false positive, we're, we'll clean that up on the next round. But I don't have to now wait and go back and forth to be like, you know, here's one, la one layer, and now, okay, this is the diff, and ask for those again. We just grab exactly what you're telling me to grab and send it in one go. So for that, I could be eating lots of bandwidth while I, like, you're sending me lots of data that I have to now verify and make sure that, like, this is, this is what I'm looking for now, just by sending me garbage. Right? Yeah, so it's a trusted connection. Right. Yeah. The, am I correct that the reason y'all, that you guys mostly have deeper graphs is because of the history of, the history of that features of the DFS? Uh, so that's part of it. Yeah. Um, so we, we have a few places um, where this happens. So the, the history is a big one because now we have uh, every change to every file over time. So that gets big. Uh, actually, also and 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 linear and and deeply cross cross linked, right? So it's not just going this way. It's also going like. What is it? Explain the cross link because I want to know this right now. So like your cross link stuff is a disaster. <laughs> uh, so if I have a, a directory, so I think some subdirectory, uh, and I add a file to it, it creates a new directory, points down to that new file, and all of the old files. So it's structural sharing. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 What, right, which isn't that. You yeah. should be able to do that. Like, well, it should not be yeah. a disaster. On that. Yeah, yeah. We, we should be able to sync a graph with graph sync. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fun fact, do not, do, do not try at home. If you go to the explorer.fw.io page and you try and load the graph, which is there, um, some of the code that tries to do this doesn't think about deduplication very well uh, as it tries to like do all the stuff. And so actually all the blocks deduplicate very nicely because mm -hmm. it does the bit swap thing. But um, some other stuff that's trying to walk the graph and basically generate a manifest for you is very sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we also uh, speaking of deduplication in in these things. Uh, so the size calculations inside of WinFS are like hilariously wrong because it's counting for every new file you add. It's counting the entire history recursively every time. So people open up um, the uh, the gateway explorer and it's like, oh yeah, you have like thirty petabytes of data. <laughs> it's like no, I've got like a directory. Sorry. So it's interesting because we often talk about, oh, well, you know, XFS, you don't really need like a graph sync for it unless it's a deeply nested directory, but if you turn on history, you do. Yeah. Like, um, so that's, that's, that's an interesting piece. And yeah, I mean, the selector performance on a cross link can be eliminated by just assuming that you're always, if you're like, it all comes down to like weird partial selectors, which it doesn't sound like you're doing. No. So uh, the selector portion is completely separate from this sync layer, right? So you could use selectors and say, hey, give me this subgraph inside of something else. Yes. But this is specifically about the deduplication and uh, batching of the requests. So they would work together. Yeah, the, 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 with partial selectors, you lose the property because of the selector language is so complicated. If you use partial selectors, you lose the property that if you encounter a link once, you don't have to traverse. You can like get to it multiple ways and mm. you can go through it both times and you can skip that as long as you're, it's like an explore all because you're always going to only, there's no like hidden things. It's a long, it's the whole mess. But in any case, we should just make it so you don't go through twice and then if people miss a day, they will complain with partial selectors and it will be rare. Um, the the but um, yeah you could and, and you can also you could apply the the bloom filter technique to like uh, like a selector query mm -hmm. yeah 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 absolutely and even you know if uh, in graph sync uh, you know you miss uh, something because you're deduplicating the link right you have yeah. this partial thing can't can't you then get it on the next round or is it is the expectation that you'll get it in one go. I mean, if you're if you're sending bloom filters, then you probably should be giving up that expectation anyway. So yeah, yeah which is fine. Like, I mean, I get like we're 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 trying to eliminate the bit swap. Like, get it in five hundred goes down to three goes. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, yeah. Is the is the query that you're sending always like if I send you just to see the everything below, or is there a method? 
like the way to like I, I I'm interested in like five year old sleep or like only explore like three leaves here. Yeah, so we, we haven't done that. That's uh I mean, and, and please, please correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, that, that's the normal selectors. So we haven't implemented that here yet. That's something that we'll want for sure at some stage. Um, but yeah, we're, we're literally just starting with like... Yeah, but what's the yeah. default right now? Is everything below? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so like the, the kind of use case we have, right, is um, I've pulled the latest version of the file system, right? Uh, and lazily, so I'm not. I don't have the whole thing. I just have like one stripe, and somebody else has made some writes, and I want to grab the changes. So I want you to give me this, um, like the top layer, um, only. And uh, actually, we um, yeah, we, we do ask for things um, uh, like lazily as well. So we might be like, hey, only give me this one one specific block, I guess, um, and then uh, and then switch into this protocol, right? For like, that, now give me this subdirectory, yeah. I, I, less of a point, or less of a question, more of a point. I want to point out that like, this highly nested deduplicated data that arises from versioning, a lot of our technologies inside of IPFS fall over when we do this. Like, think for a second about when you try to recursively pin the root of the latest version, the system, you have no choice but to pin the entire history if, if you are to properly establish that pin. And similarly with the design of this protocol, sort of dealing with the implicit, that these are differently shaped DAGs than balanced QXFS DAGs and other things because they are highly interlinked structures. And I think that's something that those of us who have been spending time building versioning systems really contend with in a way that doesn't always, isn't, isn't, isn't always obvious. Yeah.